Well, a warm welcome along then to our latest podcast. It has now been revealed that Euro 2020 will in fact be Euro 2021 because the tournament has been delayed for another year. And that in itself causes issues for the coaches and maybe some nice issues as well in terms of other players who will come into contention for the squad. Gareth Southgate, of course, has plenty to think about as England boss. It's Warren Ashurst, Aidan Perkins and Chris Rivers to talk you through the defensive options then that Southgate is looking forward to in terms of next summer. Uh, guys, we'll start off by looking at the right back, then we'll look at the left back, and then we'll look at the uh, centre back options before we decide what would be the best system in terms of whether it's a flat back four or three centre halves and two wing backs for Southgate come the uh, Euros next summer. Let's start off with right back then. Um, Aidan, we'll start off with you. Is it as clear cut as many people think that it's Trent Alexander Arnold and then A another? Well, I mean, I think so, Warren. I think probably Trent Alexander-Arnold has had um, his best season. He's still a a young player, 21 years old, but he's Liverpool's first choice right back. Everyone knows how good he is going forward with with all the assists that he's got. I think he's improving his defensive side of his game as well. And he is really an England regular already. And there is a little bit of competition there, but I think Alexander-Arnold has been so good that can you really make an argument for anyone else challenging him? I don't think you can. I mean, <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? I mean, I think if you were going to maybe potentially pick one person, Chris, who might challenge him in that role, and, it, and it's a completely different style of player because you get something from Alexander Arnold going forward more than you do defensively, would be Aaron Wambasaka, who's probably the other way around. Yeah, he's a very solid defensive option, isn't he, for Manchester United? I mean, he's made the second most tackles in the Premier League this season. And it's a bit unfair that he quite often gets compared to Trent Alexander-Arnold, I feel, because as you say, they bring different things to their game. But he's looked pretty solid in the United back line. He doesn't have any caps to his name, though, which may work against him. And you feel like maybe even Carl Walker can put some pressure on those two, or at least Juan Bazaka when it comes to selecting the squad. Now he's got more time to prove himself with Manchester City not having a set right back either. It's maybe a bit more open, the the backup to Trent Alexander-Arnold, than we think. Yeah, well, I, think... I like Wan Bissaka. Uh, I, I sorry, do. Ron, I think, think Wan Bissaka is a good player, but <sighs> is he as good as Trent Alexander Arnold? Yeah, I get the feeling that Alexander Arnold is sort of ahead of Wan Bissaka in terms of his development. He's probably got that bit more experience at a big club as well. I think we'll probably go on to talk about players who can potentially play in different positions in a moment when we t- discuss centre halves. Because I would think, in theory, Gareth Southgate would look for two right backs. Would he be maybe tempted to go with somebody who can play in another position? I mean, Trent Alexander-Arnold's been asked to play at left back on a couple of occasions when Andy Robertson's not been fit for Liverpool. Uh, you mentioned Carl Walker there, Chris. He's obviously the experienced option, bearing in mind that he's played in a couple of other major tournaments before. Um, just looking at the other options, I mean, you, you look at somebody who I've been impressed with this season but doesn't necessarily tend to get talked up in terms of a potential will be someone like Matt Loughton at Burnley. Is there anybody else, Aidan, for you that you think could challenge um, the three main protagonists who just say Alexander-Arnold, wan and and Carl Walker? We're forgetting about England's um, semi-final goal scorer, <laughs> Kieran Trippier. Yeah, I was going to bring him up, yeah. You know, he obviously is now not playing in England and sometimes that means that people forget about him but he's having a decent spell at Atletico Madrid, isn't he? And, you know, he's a talented player. His form dipped, there's no doubt about it, at at Tottenham compared to the World Cup and the summer that he had. And he was first choice for England and he was playing brilliantly and he scored that memorable free kick in the the semi-final, like I I mentioned. Uh, So I think he's, he's below the others. But Trippier is, for me, you know, an, an intriguing um, prospect and, and someone that, you know, has been there and done it in a big tournament before. And the fact, Chris, yeah, he might get forgotten about by some fans. I, I doubt he'd get forgotten about by Gareth Southgate. I'm assuming he's, has watched him a few times for Atletico this season and he'll probably have been really impressed with what he's done. Yeah, he should be because he's played quite regularly for Atletico Madrid. He's had a few injury issues which have meant he's been in and out of the side. But, I mean, he's made 26 appearances for Atletico in a, in a transitional season for them. And he seems to be taking to life in Spain 
pretty well. You know, it can take players time to adjust, and we've seen plenty go abroad and, and not get used very regularly. But Kieran Trippier, I mean, 26 appearances. He's not got any goals or assists to his name. So there again, that counts against him when you're putting him up against somebody like Trent Alexander-Arnold. But I think Gareth Southgate will definitely have him in mind. He, you know, we maybe he's got more choices than we actually realise at right back for the uh, for that spot. Yeah, he has. And I would say probably at the moment, you're looking at Alexander-Arnold, first choice in my opinion, and then you've got w- one of wan or Trippier. I think I think Trippier and wan will probably be ahead of Kyle Walker in the pecking order, despite his experience, Aidan. I think the fact that he's been in and out of the City team and his performances haven't been that consistent may well see him drop down the list. Yeah, I mean, from you know Carl Walker's point of view, he's a very, very experienced player. Like you say, he's he's been there and done it and won trophies for Manchester City, and he's got a lot of experience under his belt from an England point of view. But you get the feeling maybe that Southgate will go in a little bit of a different direction and look at bringing in a little bit more, um, you know, youth with with Alexander Arnold and uh, Wan Bissaka, like we've said, and and then maybe Trippier will possibly come into his thinking as a as a good sort of squad player as a backup that that's the way I think Southgate would be looking or, and thinking the only sort of issue with that is that you've only got a limited amount of players you can pick in your squad 22 23 isn't it so is he going to go with three right backs probably not well that's the thing though as well Chris I suppose in Walker's favor is they used him of course in the World Cup as a third center back on occasions that might see him get mm. on the plane anyway just because of his versatility yeah, that's right. He, he, he may well get the nod, mightn't he? If, if when we come on to centre-backs, you know, there's lots to choose from, but maybe he feels like, you, te- you said it before, he needs somebody who can play two positions. And if he's going to play three centre-halves, then Walker, right side of that three centre-half defence, might be a good option. The thing that probably, as you say, counts against him is, is the fact that he can't nail down that spot in the City side. And he hasn't been picked for the England team since the Nations League finals last summer so it feels like maybe Southgate's moving on for him but he's got more opportunity now with the Euros being pushed back to prove himself let's switch across the uh, back well I was going to say back four but actually back line and look at the left backs then in terms of uh, England and maybe not quite as obvious in terms of who might start uh, for England at the moment you would think probably Aiden at this stage that Ben Chilwell has the slight advantage over his rivals, although it has to be said, his performances over the last sort of two or three months haven't necessarily been that standout. I, th- I think uh, Ben Chilwell is the first choice for England at left back now. I think, you know, there's there's no doubt about it. I do like him generally. I think he's progressing well. He's 23 now and yeah, he's been around a bit Um but his performances for Leicester may not have been quite as good as he would have hoped. And, and maybe that's reflective of the fact that Leicester have tailed off a little bit themselves in, in recent months. But he, I think he's a really good prospect, Chilwell. I think he does everything right at left back, um, if you know what I mean. He, he gets forward. He's a real threat in the final third when he gets forward. But he can get back and he can defend. And he's got he's got the look of a good left back to me, Ben Chilwell. I don't think he's ever going to be quite as good as you know Ashley Cole was for England. But you know the fact that he's 23, he's playing for a good Good club in and Leicester with a good coach in Brendan Rodgers, and to me he's the obvious first choice. Um, and I actually look, you know, looking at it in a bit more detail now, think that maybe Southgate has got more options on the right than he has on the left. Yeah, I think he has, and I think obviously England have had those issues in the past, of course, haven't they, with left-sided players? Um, one thing that that might go against Chilwell, I'm thinking, Chris, now is this year-long delay. Because as I say, his form's not been great of late. The one person that I think will really challenge him for that left-back berth, I have to say, is probably going to be Luke Shaw at Manchester United. And if Manchester United are able to turn around their fortunes and Shaw plays more regularly maybe than he has been the last couple of seasons, then maybe he gets the, the thinking ahead of Chilwell, potentially because of the size of club that he's playing for. Yeah, it might well be the case, as you say, Chilwell has dropped off in in recent uh, weeks, but now he's got a year to sort of build himself back up again. But Luke Shaw has actually been playing sort of the left side of a three-man backline when I've watched Manchester United. And it's been young Brandon Williams, who's now got a year to maybe stake a claim for a call-up himself. I mean, he's looked pretty good uh, marauding forward as a left fullback. And and him and Shaw might be competing for that role behind Chilwell in a year's time. I think maybe... Maybe uh, Shaw and all his injury problems have meant he's lost a yard of pace and and, and in terms of attacking prospects, he's not quite as good at getting forward. And and maybe, you know, we could be talking about Brandon Williams being a serious contender 12 months from now. 
Yeah, possibly. Can uh, I just throw uh, another one in? Yeah, go on. Danny Rose, possibly, yeah. or is is he is he now too far sort of out of the equation? He's he slipped, hasn't he? He's at Newcastle, maybe you know not, mm. not quite worked out for him, you know, at, elsewhere. But if you remember, just before the um, the World Cup, he was he was he was playing quite regularly for England. He's got twenty nine caps, twenty nine, plenty of experience. I know he's been up and down a little bit, but I think he's someone that again maybe would fall into the the trippier yeah. category I, on the other I side. I think the problem for Danny Rose is the fact that he's been sent out on loan, and if Newcastle don't make the deal permanent, you just wonder where he, he might end up after that. So that will be the concern probably for Gareth Southgate. I'm going to throw another name into the hat here as well, and that's Aaron Creswell, um, who in theory I think has probably been one of the better West Ham defenders. Not saying a great deal with the West Ham defensive record, I have to say, this season, but I think he's been probably one of those you know consistent players for the Hammers. I think a lot might depend on whether West Ham, of course, get relegated uh, into the Championship, but he's another one who throws his hat into the ring. Yeah, yeah I can see that. Um, I, go on, Chris. Yeah, yeah, I can see that happening. I'm just looking at Cresswell's record now, though. He hasn't had a call up for England since 2017. You wonder whether, you know, having not featured for Southgate before, whether he might get an opportunity. The only other name I was going to think about throwing in, um, and I think it's unlikely, but he's someone who can play there, is Fabian Delph, and he can also obviously do a job in midfield. He has got 20 England caps, so, you know, he may be someone that may. If, it's possibly a long shot, but if he was to regain his form and his, you know, his, get back to his best, I should say, then he can be a midfielder as cover and possibly a left back if we're, you know, really struggling. I wouldn't be surprised that if Delph went in the squad, I have to admit, because of his versatility. Um, somebody else who we haven't mentioned is Ryan Bertrand, who um, I think earlier in the season had his major injury issues with Southampton, but I've seen. Saints a couple of times of late, and he is has actually been excellent, uh, I have to say, at left-back. He did really well the other week against Newcastle when they were down to 10 men for the majority of that game. Could it be, Chris, possibly, that he could still work his way into the squad? I mean, he's another one that hasn't been called up for a while, so he'd have to work pretty hard and have a fairly outstanding next 12 months to, to feature. You just get the opinion, the, the feeling that the, the, a lot of these players are much of a muchness at left-back and that Ben Sherwell... It's his position to lose, but you know, there's no saying if his form doesn't um, doesn't continue to deteriorate. We might be talking about somebody else challenging for him. I just think at 23, he's the, probably the future, and that's often the way that Southgate goes. So then, I'm putting you on the spot now. If you were picking two left backs to go as things stand at the moment, let's say the Euros were tomorrow. Um, firstly, Aiden, who would your two be? Okay, I would go with Chilwell. And I would go with Shaw. I'd go Chilwell Shaw. Mm. Are you, Chris? Yeah, yeah. I'd be in agreement with Aidan, actually. I think those two, you know, Chilwell, I've already mentioned, the best left back. And, and Shaw's versatility could play as part of a back three if needed. So, yeah, those two. I think I'm going to make it a full house. I reckon those two as well, probably in the box seat as things stand. Uh, plenty more to discuss now in terms of the centre-backs, because I think this is a probably a less clear area in terms of who could get selected and who how. I mean... When you look at things uh, from, let's go from experience first of recent international tournaments, do we think, we'll start with you, Aidan, is Harry Maguire a shoe in Well, I think Harry Maguire gets in the squad, there's no doubt. He's probably England's um, best centre-back, and I'm using that term best sort of lightly because, you know, he got his big move to Manchester United, a huge money... And I think everyone thought he was going to be, you know, brilliant from from Manchester United. But I don't think that's quite been the case. Possibly again reflective of the fact that the the season that they've had hasn't been, you know, as good as they would have hoped. But I think on his day he is still England's best centre back. He's dominant. He's good in the air. He's a good communicator. Um, he's got the experience as well. And I think he will improve. And he was great in the World Cup. Let, let, let's let's remember back to 2018 and the the stunning summer that we had. And, and Maguire was a real stalwart of of that team. So you know, I think he's in the squad. I think there's no doubt. So, Harry Maguire, would you go along with that, Chris? Do you think he uh, potentially starts? Is he? Would he be the first defensive name on the team sheet, do you think, for Southgate? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I don't think they'll look beyond Harry Maguire. He'll, his name will probably already be in pen on, you know, whichever Euros uh, sheet that Gareth Southgate is now working on because he is Mr. Dependable, I think, at the back for, for Southgate now. As Aidan has already mentioned, was great at the World Cup. He's shown good leadership. And he's, he's, I think he's actually done pretty well for Manchester United this season. It's been a struggle inside where they haven't always had much protection at the back. And I think for his first season at a big club with £80 million price tag on his head, I think he's coped with it pretty well. Yeah, I mean, you look at then maybe a less experienced option, but somebody who's really impressed this season 
in a team flying high, of course, at the top of the table is Joe Gomez. And I think he is the perfect foil laden for somebody like Maguire because Gomez has got the pace that Maguire doesn't have. Not necessarily, you would maybe say, the strength in the air of somebody like Harry Maguire. And those two could dovetail quite well together. I think Gomez's uh, improvement and his development in the past sort of 12 months has, has been great from his own point of view. And, you know, obviously that's been also really good for Liverpool. He's playing alongside probably the best centre-back in the world in, in Virgil van Dijk. And at times he's actually outshining him this season. He's been that good. Um, he, he had a bit of a trouble with a few injuries in the past 12 months, but he seems to have got over them. And I think Gomez has come on leaps and bounds. His reading of the game is brilliant. He's pacey. Um, you know he can play out from the back. Uh, he can be a threat going forward as well. And I think I think you're right. H- him and him and Maguire would make a really good combination, actually. Just looking at uh, other potential options in terms of centre half, we mentioned Carl Walker could slot in there, but only really I would say as a backup or as a uh, three centre backs. Uh, the Burnley pair in particular, Chris, will get talked about. I think more Tarkovsky maybe than me. I don't know why that would be. Whether because Tarkovsky's maybe a little bit more comfortable on the ball, but. No, either of those two would have a real stake for a, a place in the squad. Yeah, I mean, there were reports during the rounds at the start of this week that it, it was actually Ben Mee who was going to be called up to the squad for the March friendlies. And there's a piece on the Club Call website looking at why he was in the frame. Apparently, Gal Southgate is very taken by Ben Mee's leadership and the fact that um, he's held it together at times at the back for Burnley, who have kept 11 clean sheets with Mee in the team and he feels like he deserves a chance. Now, whether it will just be one of those call-ups where he gets a couple of games and and Southgate decides it's not for him, that is open to debate. James Tarkowski, obviously a bit younger and therefore that will probably work in his favour going forward with the Euros delayed now. But both of those two have been rock solid at the back and are finally getting a bit more recognition for their excellent form. Um, We can't go through this conversation without mentioning one of the players who has been the topic of a lot of conversation this season about what exactly has gone wrong. I still happen to believe that he's got real ability and could be a world-class centre-back, but it just hasn't happened for him over the last couple of seasons. That is John Stones. We saw the howling error in the League Cup final against Aston Villa, which led to the Villa goal, of course, that day. Firstly, Aidan, I mean, what can he do to get himself back in the fray? Because it looks to me as though... Maybe Pep Guardiola has already made a decision that he doesn't feel he's the answer for City at the back. Well, I mean, that might be what he needs to do then. To, 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 in order to get himself to be back as first choice for England, he needs to get a move away from City where he can uh, become first choice again for his club because he hasn't always been first choice for City, as we know. He's filled in here and there. He's come on. He was expected to be the, the main man for City when he joined them a few years or so ago, but he, he hasn't kicked on for whatever reason. Personally, I think he makes too many stupid mistakes that lead, that lead to goals and obviously when defenders and goalkeepers make mistakes and they lead to goals they're massively highlighted and he, he needs to be more consistent he seems to maybe just lack a little bit of concentration at, at key times but that's not to say he hasn't got ability I agree with you that he has got a lot of ability it might just need a move for him to maybe somewhere like I'm thinking off the top of my head a little bit someone like Leicester maybe even dropping down a little bit further maybe to someone like Watford or someone like that a team that's you know maybe on the up a little bit and 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 he becomes the real sort of main man at the back and and that then focuses him and he can force his way back into England contention because I'll be honest as it stands I don't think John Stones is going to be part of the England squad if it was this summer I'd be very surprised if he was in the squad. No, I think it'd be touch and go. I think he he probably should be, in my opinion, because of his capabilities. But like you say, if you're going on on his performances for his club side, I don't think you could see that. I mean, I think you're right. I think a move might be the best for him overall. Where do you stand on this, Chris, in terms of John Stones? I think you just can't trust him, can you? And if uh, you're a goalkeeper playing behind him or if you're Harry Maguire, as we've talked about, playing alongside him, you're probably a little bit worried and therefore distracted as to what he's going to do next. I mean, there's there's been plenty of talk this season that maybe Pep Guardiola has finally lost faith in Stones and doesn't think he can mould him into the player that, that he was. And, and therefore, if City had more homegrown options, it could well be that, that John Stones is allowed to leave Manchester City come the next transfer window. I just think there there are perhaps better options, better alternatives for, for England now and players that maybe Southgate can trust a little bit more. Where do you stand, Aidan, on the suggestion from some people that you know you might get better defenders lower down the Premier League because they have more to do? I'm thinking specifically, just looking at the league table at the moment, the likes of, say, Jack Stevens at Southampton or a Lewis Dunk at Brighton, 
somebody who who has all plenty to do in in the back line who might be worth taking in the squad just for that maybe a bit more assurance at the centre half. I think I think there's a you know a valid argument to be made there, and obviously they are maybe more used to defend him. And if you look at, you know, for the example of maybe Stones at City and you'll use, you know, Gomez and Van Dijk at Liverpool, that for a lot of the season, there's been some games where you're watching them and generally all they're doing is passing it back and forth across their own halfway line and trying to start attacks. They're not having to defend that that much. Um, so, you know, there is a point to be made, but I, I'd, I'd be, I'd be, I think it would be a stretch to suggest those two that you've mentioned will, will make the England squad as good a play as they are. I think there's a few others that you could throw into that category as well. Tyrone Mings of Aston Villa is, is, is a good example. Now, I actually rate Mings, and I think at the start of the season, he was right at the top of the list in terms of blocked clearances and, and tackles and things. So that was proving that he was really doing doing well at the back for Villa. And I think he's definitely got something about him as uh, as Tyrone Mings, and he's recently been called into the England squad. There's, there's a few others as well, isn't there? You could maybe look at Chelsea youngster um, Fikayo Tomori. He's he's mm-hmm. also had an England cap yeah, recently. I, I think Tomori's got something about him. I think this will come too soon for him, to be honest. You might be looking at maybe the next World Cup, but I've been impressed by him. If you look at the against goals against stats in the Premier League this season, and it was brought to my attention because I'm thinking about Crystal Palace in particular, who have conceded just 32 goals. I think it's like the fourth best record in the league this season. Um, they've clearly got two centre-backs who won't be picked, I don't think, but in, in Gary Cahill and James Tompkins, they've been really solid and you know bo- both still are capable of playing for England, although I think Cahill has called it a day. But also, you look at Sheffield United, Second best defensive record in the league, 25 goals conceded. Nobody really, as an individual, I always think, Chris, for Sheffield United, stands out as much. It's just that good team ethic, and that's what might work against those players being selected maybe for England. Yeah, again, this was something else that was brought up on the Club Call website recently, was that Jack O'Connell is part of that back line. He's 25 years old, qualifies for England, and, and he's playing as part of a backline which conceded the second fewest goals in the Premier League this season. But as you say, he doesn't stand out in the crowd, does he? Unlike somebody like Fikeo Tomori, who's got more to his game going forward, or somebody like Mason Holgate, who was apparently on mm. the verge of an England call-up. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was he was supposedly on the verge of an England call-up for the March friendlies before they were cancelled. You know, he's he's been excellent this season for me. I watched him play against Manchester United. They they played him actually as a defensive midfielder, but he was really good on the ball and just looked really calm and composed and you know, it belies his young young years and I think another year for him and he will yeah. be knocking on the door for an England call-up. And if you said to me about 18 months ago, Mason Holgate for England, I'd have just laughed in your face, to be honest, because I just yeah. genuinely didn't think he was going to be good enough to play in the Premier League, let alone for England. But I have to take my hat off to him. He's been excellent this season. And again, Aidan, what we touched upon about that versatility, he has played at fullback before. As Chris said, he's been playing as a defensive midfielder at times as well. That will also go in his favour. He seems to be one of the Everton players who have really come on leaps and bounds since Carlo Ancelotti has um, has come on, uh, you know, come on board. And he's recently signed a new deal. Everton was linked with a move away, but I think he is someone that would need to keep an eye on. I think what we have to remember in in light of the recent news is that obviously the Euros are now next year. Mm-hmm. So in twelve months' time, there are probably going to be a few. Pl- you, we might see someone like Stones being sort of almost phased out, and, and someone like Holgate coming into contention. A lot of it to do with age, but also to do with how they progress. Obviously, over the next twelve months, I think Holgate is a realistic candidate at this stage to uh, to make the squad. A couple of other outside p- potential contenders, Chris. First, the first one that you've you've seen a bit of. Some people have said to me, "What about Rob Holding if he was to get a run in the Arsenal side?" Well, that would be a big <laughs> ask, I think, for Rob Holding uh, to to work his way into the England squad. He's um he's still quite raw, I feel. Yeah. You know, they've picked him up from Bolton, and he's still still because of his injury, he's been set back a bit, and still has got a lot of work to do, I think, to make the frame for England. And if you can't get in the team ahead of Shotdown Mustafi, that's a bit of a worry, as far as hmm. I'm concerned. Um. One person who has had his chances before is Michael Keane. He's slipped down the pecking order at Everton, and unless he's getting regular first-team football, he won't be going. Um, some others, Aidan, we could mention. Jamal Lascelles is impressed at times for Newcastle. But one man in particular who I think, if we're going on this season's performances, probably should be there, is Connor Cody at Wolves, who's been absolutely outstanding. But it does make me wonder, because Wolves play with three at the back and then the two wing-backs who do well to get up and down and they can still defend as well, 
whether he needs that extra protection, he has to play in, in a sort of three centre backs, or whether he could still be a, a centre half and a flat back four. Well, when you look at the England squad over the last few years, and you, you look at some of the players who've been given a chance and have got a, got a cap and played here and there, you really do wonder why Conor Cody hasn't yet, you know, had a had a run of games. Never mind, you know, just the odd cap or the odd call up, because he's been outstanding for Wolves, and and Wolves as a team in general have been great, haven't they, under Nuno? Uh, Espirito Santo so I agree with you I think Conor Cody is someone that Gareth Southgate must surely be be looking at and again he, he has that versatility is he is he good enough to be first choice probably not but is he someone who you think is a good character that could come into the squad and certainly again in a year's time if he develops and continues to develop he is another real sort of live option yeah I think so and, and it does show you how many options England have at centre half you could maybe say not really many standout options but there, there's chances there for Probably a good dozen of the centre halves to to really stake their claim ahead of next summer. Um, because of this delay, now it gives them that opportunity, further opportunity to play for the country at a major championship. Uh, let's talk a bit now about tactics, Chris. We saw England play with three centre halves and two wing backs mainly at the World Cup uh, last time out. Do we think that's a, the formation that Gareth Southgate will go to? Because in in qualifying, he tends to go back to the back four a little bit more. Yeah, he has, hasn't he? And it it all depends, I think, on who you can get as sort of that holding midfielder in the team. I mean, Declan Rice and, and Harry Winks and Jordan. I mean, Jordan Henderson is nailed on to be in the team, isn't he? He's been excellent. But Declan Rice and Harry Winks are yet to really do it in an England shirt. I mean, this is getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but this will make a difference in terms of whether he decides to go with a back three or, or uh, with wing backs or, that, or the back flat back four. I think if you took somebody like Mason Holgate, though, you could go with three at the back because he could be that defensive midfielder he could step out of defense and do that job so I think he would be you know if they took him that would be an indication they'd go with three at the back at the minute though I could see it just being the flat back four um what do you think Aiden three at the back for back four how do you think it would work I mean I I think Southgate having had the success that he had in the 2018 World Cup again getting England all the way to the semi-finals exceeding expectations with the tactics that he went with then, I think he'll, I think he'll employ the, the same sort of tactics and, and go back to a, a three in tournament football because it's a, it's a bit of a different beast tournament football as we know compared to the qualifiers because you're there, um, you, you know, you're ready, you've got games in quick succession, you know your opponents, you're all in the camp together, etc., etc., and and then he can work on the tactics and it served him well just in the most recent tournament. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him try and stick with what was a good winning formula with the uh, with the three at the back. You could argue that um, you might get more out of, even more out of Trent Alexander-Arnold and potentially Ben Chilwell if you play with three centre-halves because those two like to maraud forward and of course can create things on either flanks. Um, just before we we go to who we would pick in terms of the first starting lineup for England and a back line, one man who we haven't mentioned who recently came out and said he sees himself now more as a centre-back than say like a defensive or a holding midfielder is Eric Dyer. Now, we know Eric Dyer and, and what happened in terms of the penalties and everything in the World Cup and you know some of his performance were decent, but do you think he's he's gone down that defensive route because of maybe the concerns that England have at centre-half in terms of options? Personally, I think um, Dyer is going to struggle to get into the squad. Um, I don't think he's had the best season for Tottenham. I think he's been a bit up and down. I know he was part of the 2018 squad again and you know he had a good time there and scored the winning penalty and everything but I don't think I don't think if you look at the competition for centre backs that are there that we've just discussed and there's a lot of them and then if you think about if you know the midfield that England will have and should have in a year's time I don't think Dyer fits into any of those categories and I think sadly for him he'll probably be someone who'll be watching from uh, mm. a pub hopefully <laughs> or uh, or his or his or his front room. You harsh man. What do you think, Chris? Is, is <laughs> you think, on the same uh, lines? Yeah, I think Aiden's right. I think he's hit the nail on the head. I watched Dyer play as part of a back three for Tottenham the other day, and okay, he's got a lot on his plate, hasn't he, at the minute um, with everything that's going on. Um, so it's maybe harsh to judge him on that one performance, but he did not look comfortable, and I, I just think he's had his chance. Not been in the squad since the UEFA Nations League finals, so it's tough to see him getting back into that team at the minute. So um, that is our thoughts in terms of the potential options. If we're putting you in the Gareth Southgate shoes and the next game, let's say, I know we, we know it's in a year's time, but let's say it was next week and, and we'd have the season that we've had already this time around. 
who would you be uh, picking in your defensive lineup? Which formation would you go? We'll go with you first, Aiden. So I would, um, I mean, you've, you've thrown me a little bit because I'm there saying uh, having a three-man <laughs> back four, but I, I, I like, I, I think it has to be Maguire as one of your centre backs. With, um, I mean, are we so? So are we saying then, <laughs> if we're going for three, are we picking three sort of centre backs? Uh, well, if you, if you think, I tell you what, I'll give you more time. If you think you're going to go with three at the back and two wing backs, you have a couple more minutes to decide from there. Okay. Chris, what so, formation so I'm allowed to name five then? Yeah, yeah. I think I'd probably go with three at the back. Um, I think the way that Holgate's developing, I think he could be a good option to play alongside Maguire and Gomez. You've already mentioned it before. I think Maguire and Gomez will work very well together because of the fact that Gomez is used to playing alongside a powerful player like Virgil van Dijk at the back already and, and therefore they, they would quite marry up quite well and then I'd have Alexander-Arnold and Chirwell as, as the wing backs getting forward as much as possible I just think that is where they are at their devastating best I think um, Alexander-Arnold's defensive quality still need a bit of work but going forward he's absolutely phenomenal so therefore use him to the best of his abilities I have my slight concerns over midfield still, I have to say. So I think it might be better, personally for me, going with a, a flat back four to start off with. I think you have options, as you say, if you wanted to go with three at the back and two wing backs. And if it was happening tomorrow, the first game of the Euros, then I would probably go with Alexander-Arnold at right back, um, Gomez and Maguire as the centre-halves. And I'd be tempted to go with Luke Shaw at the moment, just because I'd be a bit concerned about Chilwell's recent form. But... When it's a year away, I think there's there's more likely, as I say, that Chilwell will probably get that starting berth when you look ahead to next summer. So what are you thinking then, Aidan, for the three centre-backs? Yeah, so my three at the back would be Maguire, Gomez, and I'm going to go a little bit a little bit left field, but I'm going to go Holgate because I think he's really improved and I think if we're looking ahead to to a year, then you know he, he'd be great. And then I would put Chilwell and Alexander-Arnold either side as wing backs, so you know, essentially they could be classed as your midfield, but if you know what I mean, they're they're full backs getting forward and and you know up, up and down. And I think they'll give you great pace and invention going forward as well. Well, I never thought I'd see myself doing an England podcast where two of three people suggested Mason Holgate to start the game in the Euros. <laughs> yeah. Strange um, times that we live in. It is honestly, it is he time. is he is one of the most improved players yeah. in the last three or four Agreed. months. If you yeah. watch him play now. He reads the game, his pace. I, I, I'm almost sort of laughing at myself for suggesting, but I read a few articles that he was so that he's been playing so well. And I thought, come on, he's not that good. And then I made a point of actually watching him, and I thought, this this lad has come on leaps and bounds. And I think there'll be a real sort of clamour if he continues his performances, and he, and he will be in there. Judging by what a good player Carlo Ancelotti was as a centre half when he was a player, and if he thinks that Mason Holgate is a good player in that position, and he seemingly does because he's playing him regularly then he must be very highly rated. Thanks to Chris and thanks to Aidan for their thoughts on this latest podcast. England looking ahead to the Euros now next summer after this uh, one-year delay. And next time out, we'll be looking at the midfield options for Gareth Southgate.